the system has a number of vulnerabilities that we need to watch. Uh, but it has also been stress tested this year with two major events. Uh, so the first one is the tightening of monetary policy in uh, the vast majority of countries in the world. Um, you know, some countries have uh, started uh, early, other countries only started this year, but uh, the path of interest rates has tightened dramatically. Uh, for example, when you look at the two-year yield in the US, that has gone from somewhere close to zero to nearly 200 basis points in just six months. Uh, the 10-year rate has increased by over 100 basis points in only a couple of months. So these are very, fairly dramatic moves in the yield curve, yet the system has absorbed them. Secondly, the war in Ukraine. Of course, that was a major shock to the system, and there was a big risk of a big sell-off that uh, was uh, following the, the invasion of Ukraine uh, on February 23rd. But since then, markets seem to have absorbed a lot of this shock. Um, uh, for example, implied volatility, had spiked at 35 and has come back down to uh, half that value between 17 and 80, which are more in line with historical averages. Uh, the equity market sold off at first, but then uh, retraced some of the gain and some of the losses. Um, so, and, and, and spreads widen as well. And then they came back in uh, to a large extent. So basically what we see is that um, uh, the war in Ukraine also seems to have uh, been absorbed to a large extent uh, by the financial system. So these are two major stress events that the system uh, has dealt with well. Now, having said that, there are vulnerabilities that are worrisome. The high level of debt in many countries, um, you know, the level of distress of that debt in many countries as well. So, so when we look at frontier markets, for example, we see that 20% of frontier markets now are trading uh, their sovereign debt at, at a distressed level. Um, and finally, um, you know, there are the vulnerabilities in the non-bank financial intermediation sector that triggered the dash for cash in 2020 that still have not been fixed. Uh, so there are certainly vulnerabilities that worry us, but so far, so good. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you specifically about energy, because in the Russia-Ukraine situation, energy is like a central chess piece there. But in the yeah. meantime, the world is still in this transition towards green energy. Do you think the Ukraine situation might accelerate this transition or might delay it? Yeah, there are different forces. That's an excellent question. So on the one hand, the high energy prices, of, of course, incentivize the movement into alternative energy sources, right? Because now it's relatively more um, uh, attractive to go into solar uh, or into uh, uh, wind energy or, or other energy sources. Uh, so that is, you know, because uh, uh, commodity prices are so high now. But on the other hand, of course, in the short term, many countries are very worried about energy security and they move into the traditional uh, polluting sectors, such as burning coal, um, you know, as a short-term uh, solution. Uh, so hopefully we will see that the transition will continue, but there's certainly a risk that there's a stall and, and a move back into, into more carbon intensive energy production. And another issue related to uh, global economy is that I think not a long time ago, the IMF has said that you know these sanctions on Russia might dilute the role the dollar plays globally. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, how are we at the point that we should worry about some fundamental changes going to happen? Well, there could be fragmentation across the world. Um, and, you know, what we have uh, at the moment is a payment system that is very much run around the U.S. dollar. It works globally, and every country is part of it. Uh, but with the sanctions, of course, Russia, you know, which is a fairly large emerging market, uh, is, is, is dropping out of this global payment system. And there's the risk that other countries uh, would also uh, uh, form uh, new uh, types of payment systems. Uh, there's also a risk of fragmentation in reserve assets. At the moment, the US dollar is the major reserve currency, but it could be that it's, it could be displaced over time with other currencies. 
Uh, and then finally, in terms of asset allocation by investors, uh, the US dollar and US dollar capital markets play a particularly important role. And it could be that over time that gets displaced by other countries. Now, having said that, uh, we have seen some of those movements, uh, but those movements are typically very, very slow. And actually in the past couple of years, the dollar, if anything, has, has, has gained in importance. Um, so there could be uh, some development of alternative payment systems or alternative reserve assets. There could be some reallocation, but we don't expect that to be very dramatic at this point. After all, uh, the uh, Russian economy is only about 2% uh, of the global economy. It is, of course, very important in terms of commodity production, but in terms of the global uh, 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 GDP, it, 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 is, it is not as, as large, actually. I also want to ask about crypto, um, especially after these uh, Western sanctions on Russia. A lot of emerging markets uh, have been, like the, the crypto market has been very prosperous due to what happens in, in, in Russia and Ukraine. But in terms of you know regulation and everything, or first in general, how has crypto um, reacted during this entire process? And and do you think this will pose another extra challenge challenge for emerging markets regulators, despite that everything else has been happening? Yeah. So the regulation of crypto assets uh, is is a first order goal for regulators uh, around the world. We have called for a globally coordinated approach to, to crypto asset regulation. Um, and, um, you know, the reason is that there are many opportunities in crypto assets, but there are also many risks in crypto assets. And uh, a lot of the users today, they don't fully uh, understand how many risks they're taking. So having better regulation of uh, the service providers in crypto assets uh, could uh, significantly mitigate those risks. So uh, in terms of performance over the past six months, uh, of course, in the fall of 2021, crypto asset valuations reached an all-time high and total market capitalization was around $3 trillion, right? There are around uh, 14,000 different crypto assets in the world. And so valuations reached a very high level but then they're sold off by nearly 50%. Um, and so that really reflects the huge amount of risk uh, that is uh, in, in those markets. So as monetary policy tightened, as interest rates went up, uh, crypto asset valuations went down. And we see that there's more and more of this correlation between crypto assets and traditional assets that has been uh, coming into play. Now, since the Russian war, uh, some of the crypto assets have gained some of the values, um, but uh, you know uh, it's it's not clear that they are seen as safe assets uh, simply because they are so volatile. Mm 